All right, guys, um, we are going to continue with uh, so-called moving average processes. This is what you're going to see. So that's going to be the topic of today and among others. And uh, moving average process of order Q is going to be the following. So you'll see what is going on. So let's say, I mean, I want to express that Y is a drastic process. Following a so-called moving average process, you simply just write MA and Q. Q is, of course, the time lag, and uh, this is going to look like this. So you have a constant, usually. I mean, sometimes it's zero, but it doesn't really matter. And then you have a noise, and then you have past observations of the noise attached to a parameter, okay? And then, of course, the order of that is going to be Q. So you have, basically, the last one, which is the noise at time point T minus Q, and these are basically the model parameters of course a constant is also among them and uh, yeah so we're going to discuss some properties now there is an opportunity to express it using lag polynomials you know what the lag polynomial is so if i basically express it by b b of l then b of l is going to be the following expression so you have basically one plus b one l plus and so on and the last one is going to be bq l to the q and that's it. So basically you have the structure here. Okay, so this is how we express it in most of the time. So basically the lag polynomial will tell you what kind of process you'll have in terms of a moving average process, but that's what it's going to be. Okay, I just want to go basically further in expressing the expression B, uh, sorry, Y equals the constant plus the lag polynomial, which is attached to the noise. If you just put the no, uh, basically lag polynomials to the noise, then you see how basically how this works. So you have, of course, one times the noise, which is, I mean, you can basically omit that. That's not important, which is the noise itself, times B1L, the noise. And then this is basically how it goes. And the last expression is going to be BQ, L to the power of Q. And then let's say, which you have a pseudo multiplication times the noise. And if you basically go further, you see, I mean, this is the first one. This is, you know, I mean, the lag, lag operator interacts with the noise at time point T. So this is going to be the noise at time point T minus one. And then you have basically the last one. And this is how it goes. The lag operator to the power of Q, let's say times, I mean, this is just a pseudo multiplication, but you can call it like that. So you have basically attached to the noise. This, goes to, this is going to yield the noise at time point t minus q so this is how it goes all right so it's just you know illustrating p you got a question uh, okay. i thought that that was always the t minus minus one plus one uh, yt uh, minus one okay. no no this is a moving this is a new this is a new type But that's not the model that I will introduce you to. I'm talking about the armor model later. I'm just basically talking about the moving average part. And then we're going to put it together. But you need to have some kind of intuition why you would basically, and the question would be, why would you incorporate past observation of the noise directly into the process? Okay, so past shocks directly into the model. Although there might be an opportunity to basically to express that in terms of a, let's say, some sort of sum, and if you look at basically, you might remember the representation, let's say. I mean, let's say X is an AR process with a constant, okay, and let's say, or without a constant, I mean, to make things easier, okay, so this is how it would look like, okay, so that's what it would be. Then there was the opportunity to express this in terms of basically the weighted sum of the noise, okay, so there was the concept was zero, let's say the starting value is also zero almost sure and this is how it would look like so a to the power of j times epsilon t minus j where j starts at point zero and then plus infinity so you have i mean if you break it down you have direct impact of basically past shocks already so the question would be why would you basically do this okay and i will address this issue let's say from intuition so that's what i'm going to do but i'm talking about armor models later so this is just the so-called moving average part. And then you have an autoregressive part, and then you combine the two, and you'll see what's up. So <laughs> that's what it's going to be. All right? 
Now, guys, I just want to basically introduce, I mean, nobody's going to just consider a simple moving average process. This is just done to basically to model shocks and shocks only. Okay, so we're just talking about the noise. Why would you, again, why would you incorporate past observations of the noise up to point T minus Q anyway? And that's what I'm going to answer later on. All right, so we're going to move it backwards then. Okay, now we still have basically the moving average process, and I want to examine stationarity. You'll find that any moving average process, and that's the first property that I'm talking about, any moving average pro process is going to be stationary. Okay, so no matter what, okay, that is a stationary process by definition, let's say. I mean, you cannot say, you're not supposed to say by definition, but anyway, so I'm going to ex examine what the mean is. I'm going to address also what the variance is. I mean, the, in this case, this is just going to be the sum of the squared parameters where you have also one in there times the variance of the noise. Keep in mind, guys, that sigma squared is the variance of the noise and the noise itself is a stationary process. So you see, all right? So this is basically just, you know, allowing us to have a different structure for the variance of the noise. And there is also a property which I wanted to address. Okay, because that is among the reasons why would you basically model shocks through a moving average process. And there is the property which is called finite memory. And I'm going to address it a little bit so you see what it's going to be. All right. And but that refers to the autocorrelation. So you, one of the things that you would might you might basically do is if you find some sort of autocorrelation among the shocks, which you're not supposed to because you're not supposed to have autocorrelation within the residuals. I'm going to teach you later on how to test this. So there are tests basically, you know, examining whether a certain type of process has autocorrelated residuals or not. Because if the residuals show autocorrelation, okay, that might indicate that the parameter estimation is biased. Okay, so there is a bias in terms of parameter estimation. Okay, so you're not supposed to have autocorrelation within the shocks. So one of the reasons you might basically incorporate past observations of the noise directly, again, so keep in mind, these are shocks, is because of the fact that you can allow uh, to have the noise autocorrelation. I mean, you, I mean, you can call this, let's say, ET. Okay, so then you would simply have basically the constant plus a some sort of a shock. And that has a so-called finite memory. And I wanted to basically talk about that. Okay, so how it would be. Now, the, this refers to the autocorrelation of the process. So the autocorrelation with respect to time like age. As you might remember, if the process is stationary, the autocorrelation at time point, uh, of the process at time point age with respect to time like t plus h is in general equal to the autocorrelation with respect to time like, I mean, with respect to time point t minus h. Okay, so where basically h is positive or negative in that sense, we're looking at the future and the past, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is the distances. I was talking about that, but again, without loss of generality, I assume that basically age is going to be greater than zero in this case now. So let's say you have two, basically two uh, values that the autocorrelation can take. First, if let's say age is less than equal to Q. So keep in mind, age is greater than zero, but less than equal to Q. So this means that the time lag does not pass or bypass basically the time lag of the process. Okay, so when it comes to the time lag of the autocorrelation, let's assume that the time lag does not bypass the order. Okay, so if, the, if I say time lag, I can mean H and Q. Okay, so Q is the time lag of the moving average process and H is basically the time lag with respect to, I would calculate the autocorrelation and let's assume that for the first case that the time lag of the autocorrelation does not bypass the order of the process. If there is no such thing, then of course you can express the autocorrelation in terms of a certain function of the parameters, including basically the variance of the noise. So you have BH and I would also add B0, but basically I do this for just explanatory reasons. Just assume that B0 is equal to one, okay, without loss of generality because there is no B0 in here, which could be basically attached to the first noise, but if you basically attach to that to the first noise, you can simply say that B0 is equal to 1. I do this for explanatory reasons because there is going to be a relationship between the indices of these parameters. So let's say B0 times BH 
and then plus B1 times BH plus one. Now, what I wanted to mention here, so you understand the structure, is that the difference between the indices, so H plus one, is in particular, minus one, is always going to be equal to H. So that's why I was introduced you to basically to B0, okay? Because H minus zero is of course also equal to H. So whatever comes up, okay, the difference between the two indices is always going to be H. But of course you take the latter first, so you have basically the latter minus the former. And that go, that's going to be always H. So that, that's the reason why I was basically, I would inc was incorporating this parameter, although I might be mentioning that B0 is equal to one, as you might see here at the top already. And the last one is going to be, because there is going to be always the last one, BQ, okay? And then you have B H minus Q. And therefore, the, the two yield, of course, if you subtract the two from each other, you're also going to have H as well, okay? So that's the reason why basically I was, again, I mentioned before, I put that in here so you understand the structure. So the difference between these indices is always going to be H, so you're not going to get confused. And all that sum here, this is basically what it's, what is up here is multiplied by sigma squared, okay? And that is basically the autocorrelation function of the process with respect to time lag H. Keep in mind if the time lag of the autocorrelation does not bypass the order of the process. Now, if it does, and that's going to be the next part, then the autocorrelation is going to be zero. So after a while, there is no more impact of current shocks. I'm oh, sorry, there is no more impact of past shocks on the current one. You understand what I'm saying? So because th this is something that you can, you could understand as a common shock, okay? So the, basically, I mean, that could be the structure and this is what it is for, okay? You understand that, guys? So this is what is called finite memory. So after a while, okay, basically, in typical, uh, in typically the order of the process. So after that, there is no more impact of past shocks on the current one. That's what finite memory is. You understand that? So this is what it's going to be. All right? So let's say the noise at time point T minus Q minus one would not have any impact on the current observation of the, of the shock that you're looking at. All right, guys. So I'm going to address this, okay, in particular, but just to illustrate what finite memory is, I'm not going to calculate this function. It's not difficult actually, but it's going to be a little bit more time consuming. So I'm not going to do that. I will focus on MA1 models, okay, where you only have basically one past observation of the shock. So you have, of course, still the expectation to be equal to the constant. So you can say basically the process evolves around the constant. But I, again, I forgot to say, of course, why is the process stationary? So the general version, of course, because neither expectation nor the variance no, the autocorrelation, or no, the autocorrelation, sorry, would depend on the time lag, all right? So that space, I mean, sorry, not the time lag, time point T, okay? So they are all time independent, okay? There is no T in there in this formula. So the process is going to be stationary no matter what, okay? Even though it is autocorrelated, as you see, okay? Good. Now, I'm going to focus on MA1 models exclusively in this part, okay? because that's the easiest one, and this is the most common one, by the way. So again, the expectation is, is still the same. Now the variance would be reduced to one plus this uh, B squared, which is the parameter here attached to that noise, times the variance of the noise, and the autocorrelation would only be considered for the time lag H is equal to one, because if it's greater than one, because one is the order of the process, then you would have zero autocorrelations after that. Okay, so this is how would basically the autocovariance would look like. You understand that? Okay. Now, I want to basically go further because I want to illustrate why this is. So why there is no more autocorrelation if the time lag of the autocorrelation is bypassing the order of the process. And I want to talk about that. So I was basically just illustrating this. I would consider a MA2 model, an MA2 model is looking like this, so that was not one, but this is one, okay? So this is the last noise, which basically has a direct impact 
of the current observation of the process. Keep in mind, we want to try to model sharks with that. So Y is technically a shark, but anyways. Okay, so I'm going to address Yt plus 1 first, okay? Because you just simply just exchange t by t plus 1. That's what you do. So t becomes t plus 1. So then t minus 1 becomes t then. This is what you will see. And then t minus 2 becomes t minus 1. And that's what it's going to be. All right? So, and I want to address basically the autocovariance with respect to the time lag 1. Keep in mind the time lag of the autocovariance does not bypass the order of the process. So there is going to be some autocorrelation here, as you might see. Okay? And the question is, how would that look like? And how would you recognize this? Now, if I basically consider the, the autocorrelation of the two, so that, that's the reason why I was basically looking at it, okay, you'll find that you simply need to put together, I mean, you can, buy, you can skip the constants, because again, I'm, you might remember this, autocorrelations or linear transformations of random variables when it comes to autocorrelations don't depend on co additive constants. So autocorrelation functions don't depend on additive constants. So you can simply take them out, which I did. Okay, so I would only consider basically the noises that are here first, okay, for the first process, which I did. And then, of course, the other noises from the second model. Now, you might remember, and that, is, that was a very important theorem, the covariance of sums, okay, if let's say I have x and z, okay, and I want to basically put stress on x as well as here and here, is simply just going to be, and let me just use that in simple terms, the covariance of x with itself, which is the variance of x, by the way, but you can keep it like this. If these things are x, x y, and z are pairwisely uncorrelated, okay? Pairwise uncorrelatedness means what? Okay, that x doesn't correlate with y, y doesn't correlate with z, and x doesn't correlate with z, so the covariances are zero. If this is the case, then you would only need to look at basically the components of sums where these do overlap. So x overlaps with x, but nothing else, because there is no autocorrelation, no pairwise autocorrelation with the others. You understand what I'm saying, guys? So this is what I'm going to look at, okay? Where does the process overlap? Here is one overlap. So, what, of course, epsilon t overlaps with b1 times epsilon t. This is one, but there is another, epsilon t minus 1 overlaps with that one. Okay, so these are the two overlapping expressions, and every other expression can be skipped, which I did, by the way. So these are the two, okay, which I did. Two pairs, let's say, and then you have a covariance of epsilon t and b1 times epsilon t. And then you have a co out, uh, the, the autocovariance of b1 times epsilon t minus 1 and b2 times epsilon t minus 1. You understand this? So you can take, of course, the multiplicative constants with you, and you're supposed to, because autocovariances do depend on those, okay, which I, you can take it out. So just to remind you, the, I mean, the covariance of a plus bx and c plus dy equals b times d times the covariance of x and y. Okay, so again, just to remind you, autocovariances don't depend on additive constants, so I was neglecting them. And then you can simply take out multiplicative constants from the covariance operator just the way that I described below. And this is what you do. And then you would have, of course, if you take the autocovariance uh, of, of, let's say, of the noise with itself at the same point of time, you have the variance of it. Okay, and the variance of the noise is equal to sigma squared. You might remember this. So you can factorize. I will take that out. Okay, and then you have, of course, B1 times sigma squared and then plus B1 times B2 times sigma squared. And I would add basically another parameter B0 in there just to illustrate, again, that the difference between the indices is always going to be the time like age that you see here, as I mentioned before. And that's what you also see here. Again, and B1 is equal to 1, okay? Just, you know, this is a pseudo parameter, let's say, let's call it like that. So that explains how it, this would work. Is it clear, guys? Okay, so if let's say the autocorrelation, 
or the time lag for the other correlation, sorry, would be equal to two, then it would be different because then the difference between the indices must be equal to two. If it's three, then it bypasses the order of the model, so then the autocorrelation would be zero. I want to look at that as well. Okay, so if the autocorrelation is basically the time lag of the autocovariance is equal to two, how would that look like? So check this out. You simply just need to replace t by t plus two then. So just to illustrate that, so this is what you have. Okay, so of course, epsilon t becomes epsilon t plus two. That's easy. Epsilon t minus one, then you have t minus one plus two equals t plus one, okay? And then you have t minus two plus two equals t. That's it, so this is what it becomes. And if you want to check what the autocorrelation of the process with respect to time lag two would be, you need, just need to find the expressions that do overlap and that's the only expression, okay? Because here there is a time lag, I mean, there is no time lag, let's say, but there is a time point t. And any other expressions, every other one, this one, this one, this one, this one, are pairwise the uncorrelated. Why? Because they don't overlap. By definition, the noise is autocorrelated. So you see, there is no autocorrelation of the noise. You understand this? So these four orange expressions are pairwise the uncorrelated. So since they are pairwise the uncorrelated, the covariances are zero, right? So you simply just use those. And I mentioned before, you can simply just take out multiplicative constants from the autocovariance um, auto operator, sorry, I mean, covariance operator, and then you have the covariance of the process with itself at time point t, and this becomes the variance of the process. You understand, and this is going to be sigma squared, so that's basically what you'll have. And again, for this expression, you also have b0 attached to it, if you say that b0 is equal to one, so then you realize that the difference between these indices is also equal to the time lag. So that's the structure that you have. But there is no other, param or no, no other pair of parameters for which that is true. So if you basically look carefully, there is none, okay? So you have b1 and b2, and that's it. And therefore, you cannot generate any pair where the difference of the indices is going to be two. All right, other than that, so that's it. Okay, guys, so there is still autocorrelation left, okay, with respect to time lag two, but if basically we bypass the, the order of the process, so keep in mind the order is going to be two, and now we're gonna look at the autocorrelation of the process with respect to time lag three, you'll find that this is going to be equal to zero. Okay, and I wanna just basically illustrate, and the reason, of course, because the noises, there are in the sums, are going to be pairwise uncorrelated, as you see, because there is no overlap with it. So this is the, basically the smallest index here, and this is the largest index here. So as you see, there is no basically overlapping with respect to time regarding the noises. So these six noises, I'm talking about those. So one, two, three, four, five, and six, all right, are all pairwise uncorrelated. Since they're all pairwise uncorrelated, the, I mean, the autocovariance of the corresponding sums is going to be equal to zero, okay? No overlapping, you see? Okay, so this is the smallest index here of the blue one, and this is the largest index in there of the red ones, and therefore, no overlap, so these noises are pairwise uncorrelated. Since they're pairwise uncorrelated, the autocovariance of these two sums is going to be zero then. You understand that, guys? All right? So after a while, again, if the time lag for the autocovariance is greater than the order of the process, then the autocorrelation is going to yield zero. And that is true. So this is what is called finite memory then. Okay? So after that, after that, basically, time lag, there is no autocorrelation anymore. This is basically a property that this process has. Is it clear? Okay, so again, moving average models are used to model shocks, okay? So one of the reasons why you could think about doing this is just to, you know, to capture the autocorrelation, okay? So if you do, basically, you can eliminate autocorrelation, basically, from the residuals. And uh, yeah, and I'm going to discuss further properties that has something to do with representations. 
Okay, we, so we are going to assume that the constant is zero without loss of generality. If you don't assume that, then the result will still be true. So again, this is, I just use it for practical reasons because I don't want to waste my time on that. You already have found what the expectation of the, of the model would be. So why would I basically spend my time on the constant? Just keep in mind, guys, that V is just the expectation of these processes. All right. And uh, I can say basically it's just going to be zero. If you don't, then you can generate another one. So then you can define xt. That would be v, yt minus v. And then you would, you know, examine what the properties are with those. All right. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. So if you, I mean, that's the first thing is if b is equal to minus one, this is interesting. So if b is equal to minus one, then the process degenerates to the increments of the noise. So the increments of the noise, basically, okay, increments, Zuwächse in German, increments of the noise, can be also expressed by moving average processes as well. So that incorporates basically in this case, where this parameter is equal to minus one. You understand that? Okay, you can also have the increments of the increments incorporated into the model if you want to do that. But that's not what we, what we try to address here. Okay, so if let's say you have just the increments of the noise, that would be basically also captured by this model. Now, if I look at basically the general structure, BL again is the lag polynomial of the process, and I'm going to talk about moving average process for the one at, um, exclusively right there. Then geometric series, I mean, you know, the basically the limit of geometric series to be precise. You might remember this is going to be, and if you see this, okay, so where Q starts at point zero, the limit of this geometric series is equal to one by one minus Q, if basically the absolute value of Q is less than one. You might remember that. Now, this is guaranteed by the invertibility of the lag polynomial. So I can basically invert that, I mean, you can see this, under certain circumstance, and I will basically address when, but that's basically how I want to do it. And this is what you could have done in your last assignment, guys. Okay, so instead of basically just looking at the Taylor series expansion, if you technically, you know, you could evolve this, you can do this by using um, geometric series as well. This is the trick, okay, because the limit is one by one minus Q, okay? If Q is, let's say, the ratio of neighboring members of the corresponding sequence, and you could create a series, and then this is what you would get. Okay, so then you go backwards, and uh, this is how the structure would look like, of course. So again, if you are kind of confused, just remind you that the limit of the geometric series, again, is equal to one by one minus Q in general. So this is basically, if, of course, if the absolute value of Q is between, my, I mean, or the absolute value of Q is less than one, okay? And I'm going backwards. So I'm going basically from the limit to this expression, okay? And then you split the parameter negative B and the lag operator, and this is how it would look like, okay? So I wanna basically talk about that later on, but that's how the inverse of the lag polynomial for the moving average process would be. Now, when does that exist? It exists because I need to address it. It exists. Actually, if the absolute value of B is less than one, that's the only case, okay? So if basically this is, let's say, Yt is equal to the increments of the noise, then it does not exist, okay? So then you could not invert that, you understand? So you could not basically invert it for every moving average process there is, but some you can, okay? So even though basically the moving average process is stationary, the inverse of the lag polynomial does not always exist. As you might see, there is no relationship between the inverse of the lag polynomial and the stationarity of the process for this class because, and that was not true for the autoregressive models as well, because for an autoregressive model, this, the process was stationary if and only if the inverse of the lag polynomial exists, but the process here, the moving average models are always stationary, whether the, the inverse of the lag polynomial exists or not. But again, I need to focus on this case if basically the parameter B has an absolute value which is less than one, then the inverse of the lag polynomial exists. 
That's what you need to understand. So this limit, this is the limit basically of it. You understand that? So I'm only focusing on those. I'm not focusing on any other process. You need to be aware of this. All right? Is it clear? Okay. Now, if I'm basically going for, because that's what I would start. Okay. So this is my starting point. And I want to use the inverse of the lag polynomials to, to, to simplify things. So again, if I, I'm just writing it down again. And if I use basically, let's say, this is also a pseudo multiplication, multiplication because <laughs> the lag polynomial is just an abstract concept. But let's say if I pre-multiply basically both sides by the inverse of the lag polynomial, you'll find that this is going to disappear actually on the right hand side, right? So that will just simply just, you know, generate the noise. And that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So you need to understand this basically. So then it disappears. Okay. Because if you, let's say, multiply the lag polynomial by its inverse and disappears, of course. And I want to talk about this expression. Okay. Because that's what you, what you elaborate. I mean, what I'm elaborating on here in this part. So how would that look like? Because that's, you know, might be interesting at least. Okay, so that was the inverse of the lag polynomial and I attached it to the process. If I attach it basically to the process, I can attach it to every sum end of it. And then of course the lag operator operates with the obscure with the observations of the of the process itself. So this becomes of course y t minus j. This is just a representation. And what you're looking at is basically I mean, okay, so y t minus j and I was taking that out. So if j is equal to zero, I was taking out basically the first sum end of the sum. Why? You'll see. Okay. Because this expression is equal to the noise. So if this expression is equal to the noise, then I can simply just solve this equation for yt. And that's it. Then yt is equal to the negative part of that plus the noise. You understand what I'm saying? So this is basically what is up here which, going to, which is going to appear on this expression. Again, so I will talk about that later on, if you don't understand this. So again, the negative part of the sum, and then this. Now, you could not put the negative sign into this expression, because keep in mind, there's an exponentiation here. So unfortunately, I don't get rid of that, but it doesn't really matter. So you can keep it as is, if you like, or you can change basically the exponents. Whatever, whatever you wish, but I keep it as is. So again, why is that? Because this is the inverse of the lag polynomial, let's say, times the process, what you see here, which is equal to the noise. So this is equal to the noise itself. And then you simply just solve this equation for yt, which I did. So, and that's what you see here. All right, so this is what you have at the center. Now, the reason for that is because I want to illustrate what this is. And uh, yeah, so it will give you another motivation why you would incorporate past observations of the shocks. I'm taking that here to the side a little bit and I'm going to address what these are. Again, so this, but that's all the observation here of the current observation of the process. And if you basically break it down, okay, so the first sum n is going to be, I mean, negative b to the power of one times minus one is going to be b, of course, and then you have y t minus one, and then you have, of course, negative b squared because negative b to the second, which is equal to b squared minus b squared is going to be minus b squared, of course. So then you have y t minus two, and then you have an alternate series, all right? So in there with these coefficients and so on. Okay, so this is basically how it evolves. I think you understand the structure, but that's not that important, guys. What's important here is what you would generate an AR infinity model. So this is basically, or these are past observations of the process, as you might address, or, but that's not what the point is. The point is, of course, that these past observations have parameters, but there is restrictions on these parameters. So they cannot be arbitrary, but it doesn't really matter, okay? What I wanted to, to basically to address here is that since this is looking like an AR, infinity model with, of course, with restrictions. So keep in mind, there is restrictions that are in, imposed on these parameters. So you cannot take any arbitrary parameter, but it doesn't matter. 
the, the fact of the matter is that the structure of the model is relatively simple. Okay, so if you go further, just, just to remind you that this is, I mean, I was assuming that the constant was zero, so you have the noise, and there is just one parameter, okay? But if you had another one, let's say an MA2 model, then you have another, okay, so then you have more flexible restrictions that are basically incorporated on the past observation of the process itself. But I want to basically to mention this. So since an MA model, okay, allows you to generate an autoregressive process with a very high order, although there are restrictions, and that is another motivation, let's say, for moving average processes. Instead of estimating, let's say, an autoregressive model with a very high order, you would incorporate shocks directly into the model because this allows you to capture more or less, I mean, this is not perfect, guys, so this is not a one-to-one -one relationship, but a good model is also a simple model. So if an AR model becomes too large, you need to have, of course, a lot of parameters to estimate, right? You would basically incorporate a MA model instead, I mean, in terms of the shocks. So if you allow basically to sh the, the shocks to have direct impacts or past observations of the shock to have direct impact of the current observation of the process, this allows you to capture an AR model with a very high order. And this is the motivation for it. Okay, I will use this concept when I was, when I will generalize autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity models, which we probably do next week. So that's going to be the topic of next week. But again, I want to basically just do that. So that's what I will address here. Okay, so that's basically what I would do. So this is the motivation behind this. So let's say you have an AR50 model which is a relatively large model, you need to estimate at least 50 parameters plus the constant, okay, which might be too big, okay, and let's say if you have weak observations, you know, that <laughs> could be an issue when collecting data, so the degrees of freedom is not, I mean, the, the number of degrees of freedom is not sufficiently large then, basically, your sample is not too big, so Instead of that, you would incorporate an ARMA model instead, which let's say ARMA 2.1 or ARMA 1.2 or whatever. I'm going to introduce you to that one. So this basically means that you allow the shocks or the noises basically to have a direct, or past observations of the shock to have basically direct impact of the current observation of the process also. And that this allows you basically to capture a very large AR model instead. Okay, so you have fewer parameters to estimate, although the estimation technique might be difficult. Okay, because AR models, if the process is stationary, AR models can be estimated by OLS relatively easily. Okay, however, this is not the case for ARMA models in general. But anyway, so that's the motivation behind this. Okay, so again, I'm going to introduce you to that one. So you saw what an AR model was, you, say, you saw what an MA model was, and now I'm going to introduce you to ARMA models. And ARMA models basically, you know, you can define them by using two different lag polynomials, one for the autoregressive part and one for the moving average part, as you, as you saw. Now, if you see something like this, so some people might be confused by that, and that's, that's why I wanted to address it. So you have basically two, okay? There is a constant, and then there is the autoregressive part, okay, which is going to look like this. So you have A1 times YT minus one plus blah, 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 plus AP times YT minus P. And then there was also the moving average part, okay, plus B1 times, I mean, sorry, there is also the noise, okay, the noise which I forgot. So, I mean, of course, officially, the, this noise is not part of the moving average part, but actually, in this case it is, okay, and then you have the lagged version of the noise also. So this is how it would, how it would be, okay? So that's the structure here for it, okay? And then why would you basically incorporate past observations of the noise also? And the reason is because this allows you to capture autoregressive processes with relatively high orders, okay? Again, there are some restrictions to this statement, so this is not a one-to-one -one relationship because you cannot say, okay, an AR50 model 
corresponds to an ARMA 1-1 model or ARMA 2-1 model, so there might be some issues. This is not perfect, but keep in mind, guys, a good model is always a simple one. So if you kind of feel that, you know, when it comes to estimating AR processes, okay, the time lag becomes relatively large, and the question is, okay, where to draw the line, but this is also depending on your perspective. I would say, okay, 50 parameters is relatively large, but let's say if you kind of feel, okay, quote unquote feel, that an AR model becomes too large to estimate because there is, you know, relatively high order of the process in indicating there might be, you know, impact of basically observations that are very far away, relatively speaking, still incorporate, I mean, still impacting current observation of the process, then you would choose basically to put, or you might consider basically to put past observations of the noise instead or incorporate past observations of the noise instead because this allows you for a model to be smaller than, okay? So typically, I mean, most cases, you, you find ARMA 1-1 models, okay, or ARMA 2-1 models, or ARMA 1-2 models, okay, maybe three, so, but it doesn't really go beyond that most of the time, okay? So, again, the more parameters you have regarding the moving average bar, the more flexible the large AR component allows, it basically allows you to be, okay? But to be honest, I haven't seen a, basically, a, something like an, ARMA, I don't know, 100, comma, 20 models, something like this. I haven't seen this. Okay, so to be honest. All right. Now, the estimation procedure, however, there is also a price to pay for that when it comes to basically parameter restriction, uh, parameter reduction, let's say, or you have a clearly a small model. Most of the time, the price that you pay is you need to apply a different estimation technique. So you cannot estimate this general by using OLS most of the time you assume that the noises are normal so then you can use the maximum likelihood procedure yes sure i have again so i haven't have seen this seen because it's never the best model or because no i haven't seen anything like this before okay. okay so most of the time people i mean i haven't seen data that might basically you know consider this type of model, maybe, maybe high frequency data could be modeled by this, but again, I don't, I haven't seen that before. I think even the physical software might come to an end when it has to cover Yes, I mean, the model selection is an issue. Probably I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. So how to, and then your further assignments will based on that. So you can, okay, you need to play with data a little bit and you select basically the model you can examine what it would be. Anyways, but that's what I wanted to address here. Okay, so it comes to um, basically to, to model selection. But I haven't seen, I mean, just because I haven't seen it, it doesn't mean that it does not exist. Okay, so <laughs> maybe another field that I'm in. Okay, but typically I have seen relatively large AR models, but I haven't, haven't seen uh, large ARMA models. And that has basically speaks for itself, as I think, you know, so, but that's it. But that's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So there is always some sort, of, some sort of simplification involved in basically looking at this. But again, a good model is always a simple one, okay? Just because it's simple, it doesn't mean that it's good, but if it's too big, it's not practical, actually, all right? So that's the main reason to do this. Okay, now I'm gonna discuss this also, okay, because first off, one major issue is stationarity. Now, since basically the moving average part is always stationary, you would only need to look at the stationarity of the autoregressive parts. So if basically the lack polynomial satisfies stationarity conditions, this is stationary if and only if condition number one, the roots of the lack polynomial have absolute values that are basically that are greater than one okay so that was you know these are outside of the unit circle why I referring to that as unit circle because the roots can be complex okay that was also part of an assignment I need to 
evaluate those guys, I understand, but I, I, I wanted to make another one and put out a video, but I simply just couldn't. So I apologize. I was underestimating the time that I need to spend on basically preparing the lecture together with the assignments. But again, that's, that's my problem. So you're going to have the results anyway, but that's unfortunately my understatement, let's say. And the second one is, of course, that the inverse of the lag polynomial is finite, which means that it exists, okay? So these are either of the two. So it doesn't, you can basically, you can address it. Either that is true or that is true. I mean, these, state, these three th statements are equivalent. So this is equivalent to that, and that is equivalent to that as well, all right? These are the stationarity conditions, and you might not look at basically, you know, the moving average part because the moving average part is always stationary. I cannot talk about ARIMA models right there, okay? I'm gonna talk about ARIMA models. Some of you has, have seen this before. So what are ARIMA models, okay? ARIMA models are actually models that are not stationary, but they can be differentiated in such a way that they become stationary. So they, they increments become stationary. Or let's say, to put it in simple terms, these are ARMA models that are non-stationary where their increments are. Okay, after a certain point. Increments, differentiation, whatever, to put it in simple terms. But you don't need to know this, okay? So there is also a different class. I'm going to talk about ARIMA. The, the I in the middle stands for integrated processes. And I'm going to talk about also integrated processes maybe in two weeks. So that's going to be also an issue. I would need to define those as well. Okay, now again, I repeat, basically the process is stationary. If if it's autoregressive part is stationary, which means that number one, either, I mean, what, what I mean either, I mean, again, so this is equivalent to, so if all roots have absolute values that are greater than one for the autoregressive part, keep in mind that the roots can be complex. You might have realized this in your assignments, or you can say the process is stationary if and only if the inverse of the lag polynomial exists, okay? So which means that this thing is finite and with some coefficients here as well, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about those, okay? Because that's what I'm looking at, so for the ARMA 1, 1 model, which is the simplest one, which is the most common one, by the way, so most of the time. I assume that the, basically the mean is zero, okay? Because that would be also the mean, but again, if this is also true, if it's not, but it makes things easier, then of course the, Basically, the process is stationary, okay? So if I assume that it's going to be stationary. So then, of course, the inverse of the lag polynomial exists, which means that the lag polynomial is invertible. You can also say like that. And if it's invertible, then you can express this function, okay, by using the following in this case, okay? So you simply attach basically the inverse of the lag polynomial to this expression. And then you can look what this is going to be. Now, the inverse of the lag polynomial I mentioned before is simply, I mean, if V is equal to zero, the inverse of the lag polynomial is going to look like this. So this is A to the power of J times A to the power of J, where you would sum up with respect to J, of course, and this is what the, what the inverse would be. And if every single one of them is attached to this expression, so that's what you put in here, Okay, then the lag operator operates with the noise and with its pass observation. So there comes two different noises and then you would restructure it. And this is what the restructure, restructurization, let's call it this way, would yield. Okay, so because you want to group the pass observations and this is what it's going to be. It's not difficult, all right, but this is how it would be. Okay, maybe you can do this as an exercise or Maybe I can give you that one as an assignment, okay? So you've got a little work to do, but I would skip it because this is more or less elementary stuff. So yeah, all right. That's how it would look like. Okay, so again, this is the structure, okay, of this process. That's what you see, okay? That's what you see over here. And uh, this allows, this structure allows, in contrast to this one, allows you to calculate mean variances and stuff like that for the process directly, and which I wanted to address, okay? So the reason why I was using that is because I wanted to 
talk about the mean and the variance and stuff like that. But first of all, I'm going to talk about the coefficients. So you see how these coefficients are, at least in this case. So C0, again, this starts with 1. Okay, obviously, keep in mind that this sum starts at point J equals 1, not 0. Okay, so because I was taking that sum end out. Okay, so the first coefficient, if you look at that one, so again, 1 by AL is attached to the noise. So this expression, if you basically put the noise in, you attach it to the noise, and then you'll see where these noises are. Okay, so then, of course, you can get those coefficients directly. Okay, so that's what I basically what I'm going to look at. Now, if j is equal to 1, again, so c0 is equal to 1, of course. If j is equal to 1, then you have basically the noise at time point t minus 1. At time point t minus 1, j is equal to 1, you have j, uh, a to the power of j, which is equal to 1. So a to the power of 1 minus 1 is going to be 0. So then it simply just becomes a plus b then. So this is what it's going to be, all right? So that's that. And then, of course, you have a plus b times if j is equal to 2. So if j is equal to 2, then you have a to the power of 2 minus 1, which is going to be equal to 1. So you have a plus b times a. And then this is how it evolves. So you have a plus b times a squared and so on. So cj, this is the general expression, would be a plus b times a to the power of j. Uh, j minus 1, except for C1, which is equal to 0. So these are the coefficients. Okay? So this is how you would get those in this case. Anyway, and uh, using those, I can basically address what the mean and the variance and so on are. And it's not, a, not an issue anymore. Okay? I mean, you can use these from these coefficients if you like, but again, I will just use it directly. So from this expression, the expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations. And of course, the linear transformation of the expectation is, only, is the expectation of a linear transformation. So I'm going both ways. Okay, you can simply just break into it. Now, this is equal to zero, and this is equal to zero. So the moving average process has the mean zero, of course, if basically the constant is zero. So that's something that you should keep in mind. For the variance, you don't need that. So there is no necessity regarding that constant, actually, at all. And uh, so therefore, I would not basically looking at it. Now, regarding the variance, the variance of a sum is not the sum of the variances. But if they are uncorrelated, they are. So there is no correlation between that one and that one, as you see. Okay, Because the noises start at time point t minus 1 here epsilon t minus 1, t minus 2, and so on. So there is no autocorrelation between those. So the variance of a sum is going to be the sum of the variances. And then you take out, basically, the multiplicative constant from the variance operator by simply just squaring it, right? Because, again, you might remember the variance of a linear transformation is not the linear transformation of the variance. So, But the variance of the sum is, the basically, the sum of the variances. But if you want to break in, okay, I mean, again, I have the variances here. So I was already taking them out from the sums. And then you need to take those and square them. And if you do and basically restructure it, okay, then you can simply just, you know, use this expression and that's it. So you have the square, uh, sorry, you have basically a squared to the power of j then. Okay, so I was, again, I was using something similar already. So when, it, when I was talking about autoregressive processes, so I'm not going to do it again. But this is how basically you kind of restructuring it. And this is, this expression is calculated by using the limit of the geometric series. Okay, because that is a series that you see, a geometric one. Okay, so if you want to address what this is, let me just do okay, which I didn't explicitly, then you have, okay, the limit is, as I talked about it, is simply just 1 by 1 minus q. So if q is simply equal to a squared, which it is in this case, then you simply just need to replace it by a squared. So this is becoming simply 1 by 1 minus a squared, this expression, okay? So this is 1 by 1 minus a squared. And then you put all these things together. 
Okay, so you have sigma squared once, and then you have a plus b squared, and then you have 1 by 1 minus a squared, and putting these th things together, okay, if you want to basically multiply that by sigma squared, this will yield, and this is what you see up there, a plus b squared divided by 1 minus a squared inside here, and then plus 1 because there is one more. All right, and that's that. Okay, so this is going to be the variance of the process. Again, stationarity, guys, because I was assuming that it was already stationary. That was basically due to the fact that the inverse of the lag polynomial existed. Okay? This allowed me to have an expression for the variance that is time independent also. You understand it, guys? All right? So that's basically what, how it would look like. So if that was not the case, again, I could not express it by using this expression. And then you need to you don't need to consider time and so on. But this is what it was. All right. And the auto covariance, now I'm gonna skip it because that is, you know, I mean not it's not difficult, it's elementary, but you need to be careful. So that's going to be the expression. Maybe you can take that as an assignment if you like. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking about to give you for the next one to give you basically two options, but you'll see what is going to be. Okay, guys. Yeah, so that's that. Okay, this is how it would look like, but it, this is this expression, okay, again, it looks kind of weird, but it is what it is. This expression is time independent also. It doesn't depend on time, so this is how it would look like. But I was skipping that one because it's kind of boring, so you would not need this anyway. All right, now, what I want to talk about is the long-run co long run covariance. This is a concept, this is also a theoretical one, that you need for two things. Number one, asymptotics. Okay, so asymptotics means the weak law of large numbers, okay, central limit theorem, and so on. So to establish basically distributions of test statistics, this is a little bit beyond the scope of this course. I'm thinking about, you know, giving you a little introduction regarding convergence and distribution and convergence and probabilities. So because in econometrics, you see this a couple of times. And then, uh, but I don't think it's going to be explained sufficiently. So I'm, again, I'm thinking about it just to give you a little introduction. So then you would see basically what the long run covariance is for, because it plays a huge role when it comes to the central limit theorem to if you want to just basically develop, you know, the some sort of normality for test statistics using the central limit theorem, at least as asymptotically, okay, then you would need to have the long run covariance. Okay, because the long run covariance plays a major role regarding that. But again, I'm not sure. So I'm not sure basically of that. It's not part of the book that I've given you. But maybe I do a little, let's say, a little, um, ex I mean, excursus based on that. But again, the two asymptotics that are, are important in this context are the weak law of large numbers and one and the central limit theorem on the other. Okay, the weak law of large number is basically for consistency of estimation, and the central limit theorem is basically for asymptotics of statistics, which again I cannot address. But anyway, okay, so that is number one, one purpose. And number two, we're going to need this to define integrated processes. Okay, so integrated processes can be, or basically, I mean, to give you an distinction, integration of order zero, people use this as a synonymous expression for stationarity, but that's not, not true. In order to distinguish between basically stationary processes and over-differentiated processes in that regard, okay, I would need to define the so-called long-run covariance. Okay, so that, that is going to be a major issue when it comes to integrated processes. I'm going to definitely do that one. So this is going to be very important. Okay, maybe in two weeks, one or two weeks, integrated processes and how to test this. This is what I'm going to address. Okay, but for that, you know, for a precise definition, I need a theoretical concept of the so-called long-run covariance. So you might not understand where this, might, this is coming from or why would you need this anyway, but in order to define what integrated processes are properly, okay, you would need to have at least some idea for the long-run covariance of a process itself. Now, 
I'm also, I'm only considering the univariate case. And for the univariate case, long one covariance is relatively easy to capture. So this is going to be the variance of the process plus two times the sum of all covariances. Actually, it would be, I mean, you have a limit, okay? So this needs to be, again, for the long run covariance to, to be finite. I mean, of course, the variance needs to be finite, which is relatively easy to achieve, by the way. But also the limit of this expression needs to be finite, which is a little bit more complicated. So if this is the case, two, then the long run covariance is finite. Okay, so that's something that you would need to have. So the question is, when does, in theory, of course, and I'm going to, again, but do this in the PhD class, when is, or what kind of criteria allow us for, the auto for the, this sum or for this series of autocovariances to be finite? But that's not the purpose of this course, unfortunately. I don't have time for that. So again, you're welcome to... Uh, <laughs> To, to join these classes also. But again, that's not what I'm going to do now. Okay, so the question is when does this limit exist? And, uh, but I need to bypass this question. Okay, so not now. Um, and I'm going to calculate the long, the long run covariance. Again, this is a theoretical expression. You need this for two things, two, I mean, it's two purposes, two major purposes. Number one, as in as I mentioned before, to establish some sort of sensor limit theorems and uh, weak law of large numbers for test statistics. And number two, okay, to, to I mean, basically to analyze the consistency and uh, the asymptotic behavior, okay, usually when it comes to normality, so this is what you need it for. And number two, for integrated processes, okay. I want to check what the, basically, what the long-run covariance of, an, of a moving average model is, because that's something that you will see, okay. So for moving average model, and uh, I will talk about that later on. So the moving average model is going to be I mean, the first order moving average model is, this is a structure. And all you need is the variance and the autocovariances. Now the autocovariances are going to be finite, or let's say the series of autocovariances is going to be finite. Why? Because the process has finite memory. So if the process has finite memory, then the series of autocovariances is going to be finite, no matter what. Okay, because after a certain, even if a high, it's a higher order process, because even after a certain point, Okay, there is no autocorrelation anymore. So no matter what, no matter what the order of a moving average process is, the series regarding the autocorrelation is going to be finite. So every moving average process will have a finite long run covariance. You understand what I'm saying? This is, this is something that you can already recognize directly, guys. Okay, so I want to basically that mentioned before. So the, mo the moving average, no matter what, moving average processes will have finite autocovariances. Anyways, good. Now, but that's that. So again, the variance is here for the first order moving average process and the co autocovariance is here. Again, due to finite memory, guys, this is great because after that time lag, there is no autocovariance anymore, or let's say this is zero. And so the series, okay, that you see here would only consist of just one member, namely B times sigma squared. All right, so that's that. So this is relatively simple to address, which I do. Okay, so check it out. This is how it would look like. And uh, yeah, so basically you just regroup it uh, if you like. But this comes down to, check it out, the binomial formula. So you have one plus two times B plus B squared being equal to one plus B to the second. And one plus B to the second is going to be basically times, of course, the variance of the noise is going to be the long run covariance of the process, as you see, which is finite, <laughs> obviously. So yeah, and uh, this is equal to B1 squared times sigma squared. That's a general structure, all right? So B1 squared times sigma squared was the long run covariance of the moving average model. You see that, guys? Now, B1, what is B1? I mean, I forgot to write down what BL is. So BL is, of course, 1 plus BL, right? So if you simply replace the lag operator by 1, okay, you just got that, uh, that expression. So this is going to be 1 plus B times 1, but you can basically take that 
out. So it just becomes 1 times b. So if you square it, then this is just 1 plus b squared then. All right, is it clear? This is an expression that you see here, and I'm going to put that together later on, but not now. Okay, you see? Okay, so that's basically what it would be. Now, if you want to, maybe I'm giving you that one as an exercise, you can calculate the long-run covariance matrix for an AR model. Now, an AR model was looking, again, so everything else would be the same. You might remember this. This is what the structure would be, okay? Now, since I'm not basically interested in the expectation, I'm only interested in the variance, the auto covariance, you don't need to even incorporate the constant, but I did, but whatever, what difference does it make? It doesn't matter. You might recall that the variance was sigma squared times one by one minus a squared. You might find this in the previous results, if the process is stationary, of course, right? So that is one criterion that is going to be. And number two, this is going to be, or this was the autocovariance. So the variance times a to the power of h. Now, if you combine the two, which is not difficult at all, guys, at all, okay? Because again, you have this expression also here. So the only thing that remains is basically a to the power of h. And then you multiply it by two, and then you create a series of those. This is not difficult. Okay, you have those things anyway. And then you'll find, but you can basically continue with that. So if you, I, I, was, I was doing that at the starting point. This is how it would look like. But again, you can take that out from the sum. And then you have a geometric series. And then you calculate the limit of the geometric series. And that's that. But keep in mind, this series starts at point one. Okay, so you have a different limit, but that doesn't really matter. You just need to adjust this. And then if you do this for a while, and again, <laughs> I was skipping that. If you do this a little bit, this is what it becomes, okay? And what you see here, one by one minus a to the second times sigma squared is simply just one by one minus a at point one to the second times sigma squared. That's what it's going to be, okay? All right, so this is actually the long run covariance or the long run variance. Some people say long run variance, but some people say long run covariance, right? Because it's in a multi dimensional case, it's a, it's a covariance matrix. But most of the time, people say long run variance also, okay, when it, when it comes to, the, but I say long run covariance. This is basically easier. This is what it would be, okay? And now, of course, you need to make sure that the process is invertible. So the question is when is this finite? And the answer is, it is finite if the process is stationary, but not just that, okay? So this is going to be the criterion. So for that one, if you want to have the long-run covariance to be finite for an AR model, the process needs to be stationary, okay? So this means that basically the inverse of the lag polynomial exists, okay? I mean, you see this here, more or less. Okay, at basically point one, but it doesn't really matter. And, and uh, yeah, so that's basically what it is. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Okay, now for the, and the, this is, I mean, you see this basically directly. This is the case if and only if the absolute value of A is less than one, obviously. Okay, so this is not going to basically, this is not rocket science <laughs> in that regard to, Figure that out, okay? Does that make sense, guys? All right, so then, okay, then you need to put that together because you might remember if you want to basically calculate the long-run variance of a ARMA model, again, just for, you know, just basically for the sake of the argument, the long-run variance of a moving average part was as if I call, recall it correctly, B1 squared times sigma squared, okay? And uh, the long run variance of the autoregressive part was one by A1 squared times sigma squared. And therefore, the long run variance of the ARMA model is going to be, and you combine the two, just simply B1 squared by A1 squared times sigma squared, okay? 
So believe it or not, this is in a, some sort of a multiplicative expression, okay? Just, but the only thing is basically staying there is the variance of the noise, okay? Right? So this is basically the property that it would have. And I was calculating, I mean, of course, I wasn't calculating it. I could have, but I would just, you know, that's the result. So you simply just combine the two. Okay, you see the combination, guys? So you combine that one with that one to that one. That's it. I mean, this is enough basically from intuition. Again, but you could do this basically from those things that we have considered already. Again, keep in mind, it's just a little bit more sophisticated regarding it. So this is the variance of the armor model, and that is the variance of the, okay, sorry, the outer covariance of the armor model. Of course, you see that basically this is how it would be, all right? So, but after a while, you would take it out because after a while, I mean, if there's a second part, this is not going to be there, okay? So there is no more regarding this expression if basically for a time lag, which is two or three or more, because then only the autoregressive part will have autocovariance anyway, but that's, that's what it's going to be. So this is the final expression that you can get with Java skipping. Okay, by the way, because I was not doing that directly, but you could have done that. Okay, it, it's simply enough basically from intuition, by the way. All right, good now. Uh, all right, the last thing that I want, just want to mention, and I'm not gonna elaborate on that, is just the autoaggressive distributed lag processes for which you have an autoregressive part. So you have an autoregressive component. So Y is going to be an autoregressive one. And then you have risk, basically other predictors added to it. And then of course you have the time lags of course uh, of that as well. So this is the general structure. But if you want to look at that, so you have basically predictors regarding this one. Okay, not just basically the autoaggressive. So it, this means that you have autoaggressive models with predictors. This is an ARDI model. Okay, we use this for error corrections, testing autocorrelation, stuff like that. Okay, so you have predictors involved for the AR model as well, not just basically your model. I'm going to talk about that in detail, but I can use this definition for, I mean, using lag polynomials and I will give you the structure so you'll see what this is going to be. So let's say YT follows the so-called ARDM model. Then you have a constant, then you have an autoregressive part. The autoregressive part is usual. You have A1 times YT minus one, and then the last one is going to be AP times YT minus P. So this is basically the autoregressive part. Then you can add, I mean, the distributed lag part, if you like. So this, this involves basically some predictors here. So you have C0 times XT plus C1 times XT minus one and so on. And the last one is CN times XT minus N. So this is the distributed lag part. And then of course you have the noise. Okay, usually you can have a moving average part also, okay? But most of the time this becomes too big. So this is just simply an autoaggressive model with some predictors, okay? Whereas another process basically might have an impact on it, okay? Now there might be response and there might be basically prediction here as well, okay? So usually X is the predictor and Y responds to that as well, okay? But it could be also interchangeable okay so it might be the case that y also responds to x at least partly okay so the question would be what is the predictor and what is the noise but this is not what i'm uh, what is the predictor and what is the response okay but it could be the case in general in general setup and i'm going to give you a little introduction that both processes respond to each other in some way okay all right, but um, that's what, but it's going to be basically it. Okay, now there are huge, I mean, there are a lot of applications regarding ARDL models as well, but there's some things that have uh, basically at autoaggressive components. And just for you to, to know, guys, 
I want you to select a certain topic, either in finance, and this is going to be your next assignment, I want you to select a topic either from finance or economics, but at least it should be related to some sort of economic consideration, maybe growth, inflation on the one hand, or maybe finance, stock market returns on the other. And I want you to prepare a small literature review regarding a specific topic of your choice. Again, it could be anything, but it must come to come down to autoaggressive processes. Okay? It can be also ARDL processes, it can be ARMA processes, it can be what kind of processes you are, but you have to have some sort of autoaggressive component attached to it. Even it, it can be also even arch processes, autoaggressive conditional heteroskedasticity, which we're gonna talk about next week. So if you want, if you're into that, so this, this involves stochastic volatility models, you're gonna to listen to this probably next Wednesday. So if you wanna start then, you can basically look at that. But I want you to select a topic and I want you to find basic, I mean, you want to do a, a little literature review, a little maybe two pages, two or three pages. So that could be a paper and I want you to structure it as a paper, okay? So you, where you summarize empirical results regarding that specific type of, let's say, asset classes or economic data, or whatever. So if you, let's say, you're talking about growth and then you have, let's say, ARDL models, then you select those and focusing on that and I want you to do a little literature review regarding the empirical, not the theoretical, regarding the empirical foundings of basically of these models, what kind of basically relevance they have and why. Okay, so this is going to be more or less like a little, I mean, empir summarizing empirical literature. Okay, and then I was talking about last week how to do a literature review. So based on that, and also the week before, how to structure it, okay, I want you to write it in a paper form, okay? And have a little abstract as well. But don't go beyond, let's say, two to three pages, so not more. Okay, so I want you to basically to focus on that. It could be anything. So regarding, but you need to select basically, let's say, or either an asset class or a data class of your choice. If I say data class, I mean basically maybe I do. Or you're focusing on inflation, for example, you know. And then, but it has to have some autoaggressive component attached to it. I will announce this tomorrow, okay? but you should be just being aware of, and uh, that's what it's going to be your next assignment, okay? So I want you to become familiar with a topic of your choice in regarding autoaggressive models of any sort, okay? Related to finance, related to economics, but it must have some sort of economical background. Okay, so finance, I will basically consider that as well. But maybe it's either mostly finance or economics. These are the two major fields. Okay, if you want to select a, another field, just let me know. Okay, some people are, you know, want to talk about, let's say, medicine or whatever. Okay, I'm open to that, but I'm not basically familiar with that. As well. But maybe if you want, if you insist, okay, I will let you convince me. All right, guys. Okay, then, uh, yeah, that was it for today. And we'll see you tomorrow then. Okay, take care.